Anwar Gargash says this. We, we've had a number of strikes at the airport and on infrastructure. The Houthis that were behind the attack, this is Anwar Gargash, are too weak to impact the security and the stability of the country. Is Gargash's assessment of the Houthi rebels a fair assessment? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's fair to say that, you know, that this is a fairly serious threat. Um, when you look at the, the Houthis' capabilities in the last few years, whether it's drone capabilities or <clears throat> different types of, of uh, missiles, uh, it's a threat that's increased um, quite sharply. Uh, and we've seen evidence of that, obviously, in, in Saudi Arabia, uh, and also now, most likely, in the UAE. Um, and the challenge for the UAE isn't, you know, just uh, the Houthis, it's the fact that they have to uh, defend potentially against these types of attacks from, from several directions. You know, you have the Houthis in the south, uh, you have Iran-backed um, uh, militias uh, in Iraq, which have also carried out attacks in the past, and only last week we saw several of them uh, threaten attacks against the UAE. Um, so this is a very complex uh, security picture. Um, drones, low-flying cruise missiles, once they're in the air, it's very difficult to defend against. Um, and that's what we've, what we've seen in the last few years with the UAE and Saudi Arabia, really kind of struggling to come to grips uh, with this type of challenge. Um, and it's not something that can just be addressed uh, through a sort of a purely defensive posture. Uh, there has to be sort of a diplomatic and potentially also a, a logistical solution to this, especially as far as oil markets yeah. are concerned. How much of this is a symptom of a lack of progress in finding a broader resolution with Iran, not just on the nuclear issue, but we understand that uh, Iranian officials visited Saudi Arabia over the last few days, uh, but it's not clear what's come of that. Um, how optimistic are you that there can be a breakthrough? And let's face it, if you look at the last two years vis-a-vis -vis Israel, I mean, you can't say that, uh, you know, that nothing's impossible. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, the, to take your first point, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> the broader regional context is extremely uh, important here. It's, you know, if we go back to around sort of May 2019, uh, when, when, when the U.S., um, under the leadership of, of Pres Donald, uh, President uh, Donald Trump then, really ratcheted up pressure. Um, since then, we've seen Iran with its own kind of counter-pressure campaign. And it's really since then that we've seen, you know, the sharp increase in attacks against tankers in, in the Persian Gulf and, and beyond. And we've seen these types of energy infrastructure attacks, um, you know, most notably in Saudi Arabia. In terms of the, the talks themselves, you know, they're, they're reaching a very critical stage at the moment. Um, and I think whether it's the, the Americans or whether it's key um, European diplomats uh, negotiating, you know, they are both very clear now that we're reaching a stage where negotiators risks running out of time uh, because Iran's nuclear program uh, is advancing at, at quite a rapid rate. That's another part of their counter-pressure campaign. Um, so understandably, you know, there is great concern in the region that, you know, if, if talks were to fail, if, if they have to be paused or put on ice or abandoned completely, uh, then what happens next? Um, the, you know, the, the, the tensions in the region are already pretty high. Um, if, if the Iran talks were to, to falter now, um, it, it would certainly lead to a lot of um, concern in the oil market. We're already seeing benchmark crude prices, you know, nearing $90 per barrel. Um, and we're now seeing this sort of oil um, Middle East risk premium coming a lot more sharply into focus again. So for oil markets, you know, they'll be keeping a very close eye on, on what happens uh, with uh, the Iran talks, uh, but also any potential response to the this yeah, latest attack. I, I, I mean, the oil market reacted. The, the oil market really did, didn't move greatly on the back of this, let's be frank, up by six-tenths of one percent. One could say that the geopolitical risk is substantially underpriced in these markets. I want to get a sense from you on the global geopolitical implication. What does this do to the UAE's relationship with the United States of America? Does it give Biden pressure on the UAE for oil? And does the UAE now need the U.S.? And if so, more so, and in what way? Yeah, and I think that the relations you know, between the Gulf states and the U.S. has been you know, a great area of, of focus in the last few years. And I think within the region, there has been a concern that you know, to, you know how much of, of um, how, how, how sure can they be that the UAE, will, that the U.S. will back them up in these types of situations? Um, you know, clearly the U.S.'s uh, interests in, in the region go well beyond just, just oil. Uh, but if you look at the last sort of five or six years, there is sort of the undeniable shift 
which is taking place in terms of the center of gravity of oil exports from the region shifting towards east rather than west. So, you know, with that, there is the concern perhaps that, um, you know, some of the actors in the region are, are a little bit nervous about, you know, if it really came to it, would, would the U.S. Um, really sort of back, back them up uh, when needed? So when we saw the attacks in, in Saudi Arabia in, in um, September 2019, I think mm -hmm. following that, th there was expectations of perhaps more of a U.S. response. Um, as a result, we saw that, you know, the, the Saudis proceeded very cautiously, uh, and we'll probably see the same uh, in the UAE. I mean, they have about to, to respond to this, but at the same time, you know, that they are acutely yeah. aware that they are vulnerable to these types of attack. And even with, you know, assistance from the US with anti-ballistic missile systems, it's very hard to defend these uh, types of uh, okay. weapons and, and they are in the firing line. Where do the other powers outside of the US fit into this uh, balance of power puzzle? So along the lines of the European Union, China and Russia? Yeah, obviously, all of these powers are involved in the Iran nuclear talks in, in different ways. Um, so that that's one uh, side to it. Um, I think a, another key point, you know, coming back to sort of the, the secur security concerns. You know, obviously, the U.S. is still the main um, security actor in the Persian Gulf. There is a sense that there has been a, a sort of a gradual withdrawal, uh, perhaps since since the days of Obama and you know, it continued under Trump, uh, a shift that we're seeing. So there is a bit of a concern of, of, of a power vacuum. And, you know, to some extent that that is an opportunity for other actors to to exploit and to try and, try and fill any, any vacuum that emerges. Uh, but at the same time, you know, if you look at the likes of China, very active mm -hmm. commercially in the region, they're still a long way away from, from really sort of projecting any kind of real military power in the region. So at the moment, it's, it's incumbent on, on, the, on, on the Gulf states themselves in, in cooperation with the US and other security partners to really sort of try and address this the security threat, which is sort of growing more complex um, every year now. So, Tobian, there, there, there's two critical audiences that are tuned into this, people who travel here and people who invest here, OK? The Houthis have now said the UAE is no longer safe. This is a video that they put out now, last night. Is that correct? How serious a threat do civilians and infrastructure face? If you were to gauge the risk factor for the UAE, where does it stand on a riskometer of 1 to 10 post this attack? It's difficult to put a, an, an exact number on it, but I think you know, it's, it's, it's certainly a, a threat that's, that's manageable. Uh, we've seen that in Saudi Arabia. They've, they've suffered a lot of uh, these types of attacks, not just against energy infrastructure, but also against uh, civilian infrastructure, against cities. Um, casualties tend to be the exception rather than the norm for these types of attacks. Um, so in that sense, this, this attack is, is unusual and it's, it's causing more concern for, the, for that reason. Um, but as I said earlier, it's, it's a very complex security threat um, with, with you having to defend from, from several directions. So it's, it's not something that it can, can solve easily overnight. It's not something that can be solved um, you know, purely through uh, a, a defensive military solution. So it's something they have to work on um, you know, diplomatically in Yemen, uh, more broadly with Iran. Um, they have to come up with you know, new um, logistical solutions. We're, we're seeing plans for, for an underground um, oil storage facility mm -hmm. in the mountains near Fujairah this year. So, you know, they're going to have to be creative in, 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 in terms of how they address this risk because it is, it is a difficult yeah. one. But, but having said that, you know, it, it, it is it's also a manageable risk and you know, we're not expecting these types of, of lethal attacks to, to occur regularly.